We have top men working on it right now. Who? Top men. Hello, welcome to I Am Error. There are some game concepts that feel like they have existed since time immemorial. Tic-tac-toe comes to mind. It's hard to even fathom a person inventing tic-tac-toe. The concept seems so universal and simple so as to elude the fact that it is human made. We have records though of people playing tic-tac-toe or some variant as far back as ancient Egypt. With a history nearly as long as human culture itself, it can be easy to think of the game as innate, something that was always going to be, when in fact, it was made by people and for people. As such, tic-tac-toe must reflect some aspect of human experience and culture. Though, that may be a topic for another video, because today, we're talking about Sokoban. The Sokoban genre is another type of game that feels like it has existed forever. In these puzzle games, the player moves unorganized boxes from point A to point B, presumably where they should be. The trick is usually to fit them all together in a tight space. If this is already starting to sound universal, that may be because you've likely spent a lot of time in your life moving stuff around. For instance, when I was a kid, I had to haul wood from outside our home to the wood rack by our fireplace. In some essential way, I was playing a variant of the Sokoban game. If you have packed your stuff in boxes while moving to a new house or packed your bags to go on vacation, chances are you too have played real life Sokoban. Though it probably didn't feel like a game, but tedious work. I first experienced the digital version of Sokoban with the Windows Classic Chips Challenge. While Chip's weird little computer game adds elements to its simple progenitor, the concept of a top-down, square-based organizational game where you control an avatar became lodged in my brain for the next 25 years, reoccurring in some form with relatively high frequencies. I don't know what your first Sokoban game was, but chances are you too have played one or many of these simple box puzzlers. Perhaps you pushed boxes on your TI-86 calculator in high school. Even if you haven't played a game with the title Sokoban, you've probably experienced one that dabbled with some Sokoban elements, like The Legend of Zelda or Pokemon. Sokoban's influence stretches far and wide. As a game few have heard or discussed though, I think it's time that somebody critically considered this important genre. That's what I plan to do in this video. Explore and explain this small but significant part of gaming history. In part one, we're going to ask and answer the question, what the heck is Sokoban and why does it matter? Investigating its deceptively simple design, the meaning of that design, and what it says about normativity. In part two, we're going to take a look at the best and most interesting Sokoban game ever made, Baba Is You and show how it assimilates, subverts, reimagines, and queers the genre. In order to get there, we're gonna have to think outside the box. Sokoban games are built from a simple conjunction of rules. You play as a character, usually a man, who works in a warehouse pushing boxes around. These boxes are all out of sorts, and it is your task to arrange them in a satisfactory way. The official Sokoban website explains the basic rules quite well. One, you can push and move one box. Two, you cannot push and move more than one box. Three, you cannot pull boxes. As the website notes, these are all the rules. However, these simple truths betray the incredible depth hidden within. Just as soccer is a lot more than don't use your hands and get the ball in the net, or how Othello's tagline lures us in with a minute to learn, a lifetime to master, Sokoban is deceptively simple. Even its name, Sokoban, meaning warehouse man or warehouse keeper, implies an unambiguous modesty. 
It entices you with the ease of its premise, only to hoodwink you into playing increasingly difficult head scratchers. It seems so simple to move boxes to their desired place, but the game's one true restriction, that you cannot pull boxes, turns out to be the linchpin of the entire genre. The inability to undo mistakes leads to each decision having incredible weight to it. One false move can mean frustratingly resetting the entire level. Thus, Sokoban games are a thinking person's playground. I do not mean smart person's playground, but that in order to solve these puzzles, the player has to visualize how each choice will impact the rest of the challenge. In the game, the player oscillates between two modes, think and move. Moving in Sokoban is the direct execution of thoughtful consideration, and standing still, sometimes for long periods of time, is to be expected. Not counting whatever brilliant mind first thought to push an object from one place to another, Sokoban was created by Hiroyuki Imabayashi and published by Thinking Rabbit for the NEC PC 8801 in 1982. Sokoban was such a fire idea that it quickly became all Thinking Rabbit wanted to sell. They released some version of Sokoban for nearly every console possible from 1982 to the mid-90s. Whether a game simply named Sokoban for a myriad of different PCs, Game Gear, Mega Drive, or the NES, Super Sokoban for the SNES, Boxel for the Game Boy, or Sokoban's Revenge, the box puzzler gave Thinking Rabbit a ton of mileage. Imabayashi, mostly known for creating Sokoban, never reached those heights again and remains relatively obscure, nowhere near the status of other Japanese gaming pioneers like Shigeru Miyamoto or Toru Iwatani. There are also surprisingly few interviews with him floating around. I suppose this is the price one pays for making a game that feels so intuitive. Certain games, like those of Hideo Kojima, beg the player to wonder about who's behind the curtain. Who made this? Who thought of this mania? Others, like Tic-Tac-Toe, feel like they've always been with us. Sokoban does not feel like its design is inspired, but that it just is, and thus Imabayashi has faded into insignificance, despite the enormity of his accomplishment. That said, I found one interview in Beep magazine where Imabayashi played 20 questions with the interviewer. His answers, curt and to the point, reveal something about the mindset of someone who would make something so hand in glove like Sokoban. When asked, what do you hate most about computers, Imabayashi replied, their inflexibility. Which is pretty interesting, because Sokoban is one of the most inflexible video games one can play. Its rules are incredibly strict, its levels claustrophobic. The player can only move and push boxes. As such, Imabayashi hated the rigidity of computers and appears to have made a game just as unbending as the hardware they are played on. On the flip side, Imabayashi says that what he likes best about computers is their unflinching honesty. And true to that, Sokoban is unflinchingly honest. No information is hidden from the player at any time. The only question asked of them is how we move these boxes from one place to another. Can you do it without messing up? At no point can a Sokoban game truly feel unfair to the player because it bears its secrets as much as it could possibly have them directly to the player. Thus, Imabayashi did not just make a digital game, he made THE digital game, at least in relation to how he defined computers in 1985. I mean, this is pre-internet and everything, so I'll forgive Imabayashi if his views have changed in the intervening 35 years. But representing the best and worst of computer technology at the time, Sokoban is a piece of meta-hardware masquerading as software. The player swims in monotonous waters performing the lackluster task of space management for an audience of one. Of course, all puzzle games feel uninteresting if we describe them in such ways. What makes Sokoban fun is that it forces you to think, to play, to solve. These are innately human characteristics as much as they are computer ones. Sokoban games are pure puzzles, just like many of your favorite puzzle games, Tetris, Sudoku, Minesweeper, or a Rubik's Cube. By that, I mean that there are few layers of abstraction between what the player is asked to do and their ability to solve it. Consider the difference between Minesweeper, 
and a puzzle in an adventure game. The adventure game might ask you to search around a room for a key, which then requires built-in knowledge about where a key could and couldn't be. You check the desk, under the bed, in the dresser, trying to find this key. In some ways, playing this kind of puzzle is less about knowing where a key should be and thinking in terms of hide and seek, asking where would the developer not expect me to look. Minesweeper, on the other hand, has no hidden key. Instead, it presents you with a simple puzzle. Uncover all the safe spaces without clicking on any mines. Every game, in a sense, plays out the same way. Either you manage to not click on a mine, or you screw up and get blown away. Even though the maps are randomly generated, the rules and path to salvation remain the same each game. Regardless, the player must enact the principles of the game in order to succeed. Just randomly clicking without thought will lead to defeat. This happens in all peer puzzle games, from Tetris to Sokoban. Thus, peer puzzle games do not lose their luster after you know the solution. In a generic adventure game, if you know where the key in that room is, that's it. The mystique is gone. You might think, because of the lack of randomly generated assets, that a Sokoban game would be more like finding a key in a room, but it's weird. And you'll have to trust me on this, or you can go play some Sokoban yourself, but if you've solved a Sokoban puzzle before and encounter it again, you will have to think about how to solve it. You probably aren't going to remember all 500 or so steps you took to solve the room. Instead, you have to rely on the game's fundamental truths to advance. Sokoban games are not riddles with a unique solution, they are puzzles with an underlying principle that informs how you should approach them. To ignore these principles means failure. The key difference between Sokoban and other pure puzzle games though is that the player actually controls a character while playing. In Tetris, the player plays as whatever piece is falling at any given moment. In Minesweeper, the player plays as their mouse on an abstract field of mines. In Sokoban though, you are ostensibly the person down there. And yes, I mean down there, because like God, we look at the Sokoban hero from above. This diminutive character, smaller than the boxes they push around, defines the player's limitations. If they could jump or teleport, or if the player could drag boxes disembodied with the cursor, then the concept of a Sokoban game would be completely lost. It is only because the player is stuck in a feeble body that the gameplay proves any challenge. Sokoban is built entirely out of limitations. What you can't do defines how you have to play the game. Break any of the core promises of the genre and the entire thing falls apart. If you could pull boxes, then every puzzle would become trivial. Sokoban, like another great puzzle game, Sudoku, has nothing that can be subtracted without fundamentally changing the game itself. While I hesitate to say it, this has to make Sokoban a perfect game, right? If you cannot add or subtract from the formula without fundamentally changing it, then it must be flawless, right? Yet, there is one unavoidable flaw of Sokoban. It's tedium. But in order to discuss that, we're going to have to consider the broader meaning of Sokoban. As you could probably guess, it is a game about rules and order, concepts which, like the immemorial reality of boxes that have to be moved, cannot exist without some amount of banality. Sokoban games are built upon explicit and implicit rules. We have mostly covered the explicit rules already. Get the boxes to their rightful place, you can only push one box at a time, and you can't pull boxes. Outside of these, we can also consider that in Sokoban, all objects are exactly the same size, forming a grid, and that the player moves one square in that grid at a time. The uniformity of all objects is crucial for achieving the sense of unflinching honesty that Imabayashi describes. Yet, like computer code and language, the basic rules don't reveal all possible limitations. There are a myriad of structural, implicit laws that the player must also follow. The first implicit rule the player is likely to learn is that they shouldn't push boxes into a corner. Once in a corner, there is not a vantage point for the player to push the box. And because they cannot pull boxes, that box cannot be moved. 
In some puzzles, you may need to place a box in a corner, but if this is not the case, corners must be avoided at all costs. As this implicit rule suggests, all walls are relatively dangerous. As such, most implicit rules run up against them. Another would be that you should not put two boxes against a wall next to each other, because, as you might be able to deduce, you will have effectively put them in a corner against one another. Similarly, if you put a box against a wall, you better have a way to get it off that wall, or else it will also be stuck there forever. One more. Do not put boxes into a square, because, you guessed it, you will have cornered them all. The danger of Sokoban is that breaking these implicit rules is not always apparent, but is always deadly. You will sometimes realize that you trapped a box on a wall or in a corner only after you've already put all the other boxes in their place, and your only way to proceed will be to restart. A mistake in Sokoban is a deadly poison with no antidote. It will get you in the end, even if you feel fine right now. After being poisoned enough times, the player grows weary of any hastily made moves. Particularly, those which do not put boxes in their designated locations fall under heavy suspicion. They will think, this box is in my way, but if I move it, will it screw me over down the line? They will trace their actions to an inevitable conclusion, patiently ensuring victory in the end. Thus, despite their complete lack of violence, Sokoban games are risky affairs. Failure is always an option on the table. What strikes me as odd is that nowhere in the explicit rules of Sokoban is failure mentioned or implied. And this is because, as you have probably noticed, all aspects of failure in Sokoban are consequences of level design, not the game's base rules. In theory, if I give you a Sokoban level infinitely large and with no walls, no matter how many boxes I need you to move, you could get them all there, with relatively few possible fail states. You know, the corners. Therefore, Sokoban games are chiefly about level design, and each level is about the interplay between the game's explicit and its implicit rules. The player's goal is to figure out how to use the explicit directions of the game to defeat the specter of implicit rules hanging above them. This means one of two things. Either failure is entirely a consequence of level design, or we cannot unlink the game of Sokoban from its level design. It can be tricky to disconnect any game from the levels within it. Super Mario Bros. is a platformer in part because there are bottomless pits the player must avoid, a feature of the game's level design. Being a level designer is pretty much on par with game design. After all, Doom Wads and Super Mario Maker or any level editors are pretty much game design tools. But in these examples, there are seemingly infinite possibilities for level design extended from the base rules of Doom and Super Mario. But this is not the case for Sokoban. Not only does the player need to follow the strict, explicit, and implicit rules of the Sokoban game, but so too does the level designer who must construct a level that can be completed using its explicit rules. Thus, to make a Sokoban level is to play the implicit game of Sokoban explicitly, or in reverse. Even if we believe that this is the case for all level design, Sokoban's relative simplicity makes this relationship more apparent than any other game. There are just not enough tools at the designer's disposal for them to work in any other way. Though, there are two ways that the Sokoban formula has been improved upon in follow-up games. The addition of a step counter and the reverse button. Both can be found in my preferred version of the game, the SNES's Super Sokoban. The reverse button does exactly what you'd expect it to do. It reverses your actions. This can give the illusion of breaking the core promise of the Sokoban game, as your character may appear to be pulling boxes. The scandal. But in reality, they are unpushing them. A surprisingly unintuitive difference. This tool does not influence how the player solves the game puzzles, but it does make the Sokoban experience a bit more forgiving. Without it, an accidental button press can spell unintentional doom. I suspect at least some piece of hardware has been thrown or smashed because of a false move in Sokoban, because as we've already discussed, the consequences for mistakes are quite high due to the nature of the puzzle. The rewind button is thus a welcome addition. 
a quality of life improvement rather than a change to gameplay. The same cannot be said for the step counter. In Super Sokoban, taking too many steps produces an angry boss berating you for wasting company time and money with your inefficient warehouse management, you poor Amazon employee. The step counter is a strange addition to the game. Nominally, it forces the player to think about how they are moving and to complete puzzles with as little extraneous steps as possible. But in practice, it often does not affect how the player solves the problem at all. Rare is the Sokoban step counter so strict that the player has one way of solving a puzzle and must rethink all their steps to solve it a different way. The step counter gives the player one additional thing to worry about, but all it really does is act as a way to enforce the routine of play we've already described. Think and move. All of these patterns of design coalesce in a simple fact. Sokoban is about order. It is about making a discordant world right. And what it reveals about order is quite profound. There's a lot of tedium in keeping things moving smoothly. In a Sokoban game, knowing the correct order is only half of play. The other half is moving boxes into the right place once you know the solution. This can take a lot of time, which helps give heft to the consequences of failure. But it is also tedious. To play Sokoban is to relish in monotony. In this way, it's a lot like the actual warehouse task of organizing and stacking boxes, though without the back pain and peeing in bottles. You're doing the same actions over and over until the job is done. But this is how order is often maintained, through monotony. Think about how you get good at any skill. You first visualize how to do something, and then you do it enough so that it becomes automatic. I play guitar, and when I first learned, just making my fingers into the shape of a chord was quite the trial. Now it is routine, it is automatic, it is orderly. Whether it is in Sokoban's strict adherence to a set of explicit and implicit rules, the inability to circumvent those rules in any significant fashion, or the tedious routines it forces upon the player, the game is always about order putting things in order and doing it in the right order. If order is always tedious, then it stands to follow that Sokoban must be, at least at times, tedious as well. This relationship between Sokoban and order points to a culturally significant undercurrent of the game. It reinforces normativity. Normativity refers to what a society understands as desirable and undesirable, typically regarding human behavior. A normative claim is one which seeks to corral a person's actions or worldview through an appeal to an invisible right and wrong way that things are to be done. For instance, if you work at McDonald's and say you are underpaid, you are making a normative claim about what would be a fair value for your labor. I use this example in particular because normative claims are not inherently good or bad, but if they are used without the listener understanding that a normative claim is being made, the underlying logic goes unnoticed. So what goes unnoticed in Sokoban? The most obvious answer is, why do these boxes need to be placed into these particular places? No reason is ever truly given for the player. It is taken for a given that order is the preferred state of things, though order is simply wherever the dots indicate where the boxes should go. This order is artificial for all intents and purposes. It makes the game more fun and interesting, but it reinforces the idea that the player should follow the rules, that there is a normal way the world should be, and your job is to tediously reinforce this normativity. This kind of normativity does not just exist in the game's internal design, but also in what little story it has for its audience. This typically manifests itself in heteronormativity, or normativity which presents heterosexuality as a natural way of things. In Super Sokoban's opening cutscene, the main character's romantic advances toward a woman are spurned in favor of presumably another man with a nicer car. The main character then resolves to earn enough money to buy a nice car himself, in order to win the hearts of women everywhere. This character is enacting normativity in a number of ways. First, he presumes that his problem with women is not related to him, but to the way that women are. 
Women like men with nice cars, ipso facto, a lot of money. He also presumes that wearing himself out at his warehouse job will result in more money, a normative belief that hard work will result in monetary gain. Of course, in both of these instances, these normative assumptions are incredibly reductive. Perhaps this character should work on his personality or not trying to pick up women who are walking down the middle of the road. And it is not a given that working harder at your warehouse job will yield you the money to compete with a rich guy in his sports car. Similarly, in the opening sequence of Boxel, the main character says he will get a gift for a love interest. A gift presumably earned by organizing thousands of boxes. He is rewarded at the end of the narrative with her affections. Again, there is a normative presumption here the character is making, that to be loved he must make money, and to make money he must work hard. It is at this point that I would be remiss to not note the weird inversion of this trope in Boxel 2, in which the main character's love interest is stolen by aliens, and he resolves to buy a rocket to, in order to save her. What an amazing motivation for organizing your boss's boxes. This is the employee Elon Musk has always dreamed of. The ending cutscene returns to a familiar status quo though. The player character reaches the aliens, who tell him that in fact, his girlfriend is the princess of their world, and that they have seen that he is a wonderfully competent worker and want to make him co-ruler of the entire planet. Which again, reinforces that if you just work hard and do your job, you will get the keys to everything, even an alien world, I guess. It has this awful arranged marriage vibe too. Reminds me of Jacob from the Bible, who worked for seven years to marry Rachel only to be hoodwinked and given Leia, and then worked seven more years to get the girl he actually wanted. I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that even the Bible normalizes that hard work wins the heart of women. We can track the explicit and implicit rules of Sokoban onto these kinds of normativity. Explicit rules would be like the laws that prohibit non-normative acts. These might include defining marriage as between a man and a woman, such as the Defense of Marriage Act, or punishing sexual acts between members of the same sex. Recent pushes in legislature across the U.S. to limit the activities of transgender youth, particularly in the realm of competitive sport, are attempts to establish a heteronormativity of who is allowed to participate and who is not. The important thing to understand here is that, like the basic rules of Sokoban, these laws are binding. They don't just infer some kind of normativity, they enforce it upon those unwilling to follow suit. All laws are, in some ways, normative, I guess. If a law says not to steal or not to murder, that makes a normative judgment on what a society values. But the logical underpinning of heteronormative laws often jumps through additional hoops so as to obscure that these laws are being made in the service of constructing a society that includes some us and excludes some them from public life. Of course, normativity is more often enforced implicitly. Whether it is gender reveal parties or the fact that every Shakespeare comedy ends in marriage, the result of implicit normativity is to make a culture that takes for granted that many of these distinctions are, in fact, arbitrary. These implicit norms sometimes act like the corner in a Sokoban game, where people can feel trapped by normativity with no way out, like they are damned if they do the non-heteronormative thing and damned if they don't. Like Sokoban, we can imagine that society is constructed out of a set of explicit and implicit rules. And this is a way to generate order through invisible right and wrong choices whose true purpose is taken for granted. Again, normativity is bound to happen in any group of people. The problem is when normativity goes unchallenged, because that yields unthinking people. While we can find normative claims in every kind of media, what is striking about the Sokoban genre is how much it models normativity in its construction. I don't think that it is a coincidence that sex and Sokoban seem to go hand in hand, whether it is in the scenes of Sokoban games we've already mentioned above, the strange pseudo-sexual vibe of a box game like Catherine, attempts to get a harem in the Sokoban-esque game Helltaker, or the many lewd titles one finds when searching Sokoban on Steam. There are way more than you would expect. Sex and courtship are aspects of life that particularly tend to be surrounded by peculiar and arbitrary norms, 
as evidenced by the invasive existence of heteronormativity in Western culture. These games, whose ludic structure is fundamentally about order, also contain thematic material that both challenges and mostly reinforces the capitalistic and sexual status quo. This matters because as I've already noted, Sokoban games feel as though they've existed time immemorial. The genre does not seem so much as invented by some creative genius, but that someone would have thought of it eventually. It appears as self-evident, like tic-tac-toe. That feeling in itself is a kind of invisible normativity placed upon you. We have to be able to reckon with the fact that all games are man-made and reflect aspects of culture. For Sokoban, this means understanding that in both its narrative and gameplay, it projects a vision of the world as it quote, should be. That is problematic because it never asks us to consider if the goals of normativity themselves are valuable. It simply asks us to put our head down and do our job. Interestingly, because the play pattern of Sokoban is think and move, the player ends up having a lot of time to ponder things while moving, and it is while pondering that we start to see and feel the cracks of normativity in its tedium. Cracks that are busted wide open in the wonderfully queer love letter to Sokoban. Baba is you. Welcome back. Baba Is You is a 2019 puzzle game made by Finnish indie developer RV Taikari. In this surreal Sokoban experience, the player usually controls Baba, a rabbit whose sole goal is to win, sometimes by touching a flag. At a passing glance, we can see a resemblance to Sokoban in Baba's aesthetic. Everything in the game is exactly one square big, the player's avatar manipulates the world by pushing squares around, and while the goal is different, getting your avatar to the right place is not that dissimilar from moving a group of boxes to the right place. It is my contention that Baba Is You is a Sokoban game, but before we get to why I think that, let's first talk about the unique ways it differentiates itself from the genre. You can push multiple squares at the same time, the levels are typically wide open fields rather than enclosed labyrinths. Oh, and you can change the fabric of reality by reconstructing the rules of the game on the fly. Really, that last point is the most important one. The rules of any given level in Baba Is You are encoded syntactically within the Sokoban format. The name of the game is an example of this. Baba Is You, or You the player are Baba. These simple sentences are the building blocks of the game's rules and are meant to be reconstructed, provided you have the space for the syntax. Baba Is You, like many popular indie games, was first constructed at a game jam. The theme of the jam was not there, and Taikari says he got the mental image of a Sokoban-like game that used the not operator, meaning a game where the player could turn on and off what is true or false. The you and win functions are the clearest examples of this. You determines who or what the player is. Based on the name of the game, the player would probably assume that Baba is you, but really, you can be any object in the game, and likewise, any object can be win. Nothing is fixed in Baba is you. Like any language, there are nouns, verbs, adjectives, and prepositions to play with. Like Captain Kirk's famed solution to the Kobayashi Maru test in Star Trek, the player is challenged to change the rules of the game in the face of an otherwise no-win scenario. The player's goal is not to put everything in its right place, but change the rules until they allow her to succeed. The player breaks the world rather than organize it. As a result, Baba Is You is necessarily more abstract than Sokoban, as it deals in language and objects, not just the latter. Unlike the many boxes of Sokoban, which are all uniform in their function, 
everything in Baba Is You needs to be looked at sideways, as though nothing were what it appears to be. A wall may appear to impede progress, but if the rules of the level don't explicitly say you can't, then it's just set dressing. Simply put, Sokoban is about what is, and Baba Is You is about what could be. Yet, upon closer examination, Baba Is You is certainly a Sokoban game. First of all, while sentences can be reconstructed to solve puzzles, the game employs the same corners are death design of the Sokoban game. Rules that the game doesn't want you to mess with are stored away in corners, unable to be changed. The game has the same top-down perspective, and the player's primary limitation is that they only move one square at a time. When moving around, corners and walls are still dangerous, as texts and objects placed upon them become stuck and sometimes unusable. The syntax of the game, which forces the player to construct sentences from left to right or up to down, is exactly the kind of explicit rulemaking Sokoban is fond of. Perhaps most pertinently, it has the exact same play pattern as traditional Sokoban. Think and move. Nearly 40 years after Thinking Rabbit first published Sokoban, that stubborn style still remains. There are some timed events in Baba's You, but like Super Hot, they only occur when the player chooses to move or wait. Thus, the player has infinite time to ponder their decisions and come up with a solution. Just like Sokoban, even if there are many different ways for the player to reach their goal, both games are explicit that the player reached the desired destination of win. Where Baba Is You rises above Sokoban is in its novelty. If Sokoban puzzles have tedious solutions, any tedium in Baba Is You tends to be quickly forgotten because each solution feels earned, like the player really needed to think outside the box in order to receive a passing grade. That moment the player realizes the solution to a puzzle is surreal, like to become a wall or to make themselves a key, or to multiply themselves infinite times. It is so damn rewarding that the only tedium of Baba Is You is when you struggle to figure out a puzzle and start banging your head against the game trying to get at it. And compared to traditional Sokoban, with its reliance on the player learning key principles of play and applying those principles to solve the game, principles are your own worst enemy in Baba Is You. Everything must be challenged if you want to succeed. Thus, like Neon Genesis Evangelion is a mecha anime that deconstructs mecha animes, Baba Is You is a Sokoban game that deconstructs Sokoban. Sokoban is static, with rigid rules. Baba Is You is dynamic, with flexible ones. Sokoban asks you to use one tool, one object, one avatar to solve each puzzle. Baba Is You asks you to make your own tools, reimagine your own objects, become many avatars in the pursuit of solving the game. Sokoban is about work and labor. Baba Is You is about creativity and exploration. Baba Is You points in some ways to everything that Sokoban is not, while still somehow being a Sokoban game. And that's the trick. If it wasn't a Sokoban game, then it wouldn't be pointing to anything. Dark Souls isn't a deconstruction of Tetris, and Half-Life isn't a deconstruction of Super Mario Bros. In order for something to deconstruct something else, it needs to share some DNA. For Jacques Derrida, the most prominent proponent of the philosophical method of deconstruction, we understand the meaning of words through their negatives. Dry has meaning only in relation to wet. Derrida calls this difference. To fully know something, we should seek to understand what isn't being said, as meaning is found in the relationship between things, not in the things themselves. These connections or relationships never fully end. They are never fulfilled. The classic example is that of a dictionary, where looking up one word yields a definition comprised of more words, all linking to one another. Derrida was particularly invested in language, showing how words and things don't have some eternal essence, only appearances. 
For Baba is You, we understand the gameplay, the way it functions in relation to what it is not. As its key features suggest, it is not Sokoban, even though it has many hallmarks of the genre. And thus, it is exceedingly interesting to me that Baba and their in-game friend Kiki take their namesake from the famous Boba Kiki experiment. For those unfamiliar, this inquiry asks people from different parts of the world who speak different languages to assign preset names to differing shapes. Researchers have found that across the world, people prefer to name this jagged figure Kiki and this bulbous one Boba. As with most interesting scientific things, Tom Scott has a video on this if you want to learn more. Regardless, this experiment endeavors to prove that some aspects of language may be universal. This doesn't jive too well with Derrida, whose whole point is that language only has meaning because of contrast. That meaning arises out of difference. To question what we believe is innate or normative. But perhaps this is because, just like Sokoban, Baba Is You is still a game about explicit and implicit rules. And these rules, at their core, indicate an essence beyond language. While Baba Is You is a game about changing rules, it slyly makes some rules immutable. If, for instance, a rule reads wall is stop, and then is surrounded by walls, the player has no way to interact with that set of words. Any such sentence is akin to the explicit rules of Sokoban, core tenets the player must take into consideration as they attempt to solve the puzzle. The reason these rules are sectioned off makes perfect sense from a puzzle game perspective. If every noun is modifiable, then any sense of challenge in Baba Is You would be lost. But because such explicit rules are no longer just in an instruction manual, but literally there for the player to read on the screen at any given time, the distinction between object or sign and the word or the signifier becomes impossible to parse. This unification of sign and signifier could be construed as logocentrism. Logocentrism is a little tricky to define. In some contexts, it refers to the distinction between speech and a written word, arguing that the latter is just a signifier and that speech itself is the real juice. Derrida rips this apart, and while it would take me too long to recap his entire argument, suffice to say that both speech and written word are signifiers. One is not more valid than the other. The other way of defining logocentrism is the idea that words and language are representative of something beyond themselves, that they reflect an essence. If you are familiar with platonic forms, where objects in the physical world point to a metaphysical reality that exists beyond our own, that is kind of what logocentrism is, except that it views language as having that crucial, irreducible essence. Baba is you is logocentrism, the game. While Baba is Boulder makes all Babas boulders or Kiki is Push changes how Kiki works, showcasing a flexible game world, the words themselves always refer to an essential form beyond themselves. Baba is Baba, the plucky little puzzle-solving rabbit. The word Baba always means the exact same thing. It points to an external reality beyond the level in question. You can't construct a sentence where flower is Baba and have anything other than the flowers becoming Baba. This is the implicit reality of Baba is You. Just as in Sokoban, the player cannot push a box into a corner or get a box off a wall, the game implicitly tells the player that the word flower always refers to the exact same expected thing. The game beautifully engages with this further in puzzles using the word and text keywords. The word keyword flips the script on how language functions, allowing objects to become words. For instance, normally, to push a boulder, the player would need to make a sentence that reads, boulder is push. But if boulder is word, then placing a boulder at the start of the sentence accomplishes the same task as having the word boulder there. The text keyword literally objectifies language. If text is float, then all texts float. If text is 
open, then the text becomes a key that can unlock doors. In both of these cases, what is language and what is object is obfuscated. They function identically, so they might as well be the same thing. Making words and objects interchangeable is like supercharged logocentrism, where a word does not just hint at some eternal essence in the object it signifies, but the object itself also signifies the word that represents it. It's like a metaphysical Mobius strip, an infinite loop of the physical and the representative interacting with one another. There is perhaps no game that so artfully projects Plato's allegory of the cave as Baba is You. It is important to note that if Baba is You was just a playground for changing terms and identities, these wouldn't really be implicit rules. But because it is a puzzle game with right and wrong actions, the solutions to win and the solutions to fail, the player must engage and in a sense believe in the logocentrism of the world to play the game. This would perhaps be deeply troubling for Derrida, who potently rejected this kind of logocentrism, and as we have already noted, understands language as informed by difference rather than essence. Derrida's term trace is quite helpful for understanding why Baba is Yu's use of language is perhaps problematic. Derrida writes that the trace is not a presence, but it is rather the simulacrum of a presence that dislocates, displaces, and refers beyond itself. The trace has, properly speaking, no place for effacement belongs to the very structure of the trace. Trace, then, is not too dissimilar from difference. It refers to the fact that any sign contains within it things it does not mean. A literal example of this would be the word woman, which in itself contains the word man, ostensibly its opposite. The word woman does not make sense except in relation to the word man. Every word, even those not in a binary relationship like this, contain traces of the things they are not even synonyms. Push and shove are similar words, but they hint at the other when you use one in a sentence. If we imagine shove to imply more malice or aggressiveness, then saying she pushed him has a different meaning than she shoved him precisely because of what is absent. As I've already argued, Baba is used words contain no such trace in them. We could graft some amount of trace onto the game if we try to imagine that Baba is Baba and therefore not Kiki, but because Baba is Baba even if Kiki does not exist, they do not have a relationship. They do not inform each other. You could subtract one and the other could still exist. Meanwhile, any sentence shifting to change the meaning of words might change the essence of that word or object but it still affirms that it has some essence. You, as the omnipotent god of this realm, can manipulate those essences, but not that such essences exist. Thus, Baba is You subverts the rules of Sokoban in the way we traditionally think of language, but embodies the spirit of those rules in its design. It deconstructs Sokoban and language, but instead of deconstructing to get at some deeper meaning in their artifice, Baba is You is about reassembling that language to serve a new purpose. Chiefly, solve puzzles. This isn't a negative quality though. I think it's what makes Baba is You queer. It's probably best at this point that we define queer though it is a famously slippery term and I'm not quite qualified to give an exact definition. For our purposes, I defer to Bo Ruberg's discussion in Video Games Have Always Been Queer. First, that queer encompasses all the identities described by the acronym LGBT and many more, though not everyone in these categories self-identifies as queer. If we were going solely by this definition, I think it would be a mistake to describe Baba is You as queer, because there is little evidence of gender or sexuality in the world of the game, only puzzles. But Ruberg gives a second definition, more conceptual in nature. To be queer 
is to resist the hegemonic logics that dictate what it means to be an acceptable, valued, heteronormative, or homonormative subject. Queerness challenges dominant beliefs about pleasure and power. It names a longing to live life otherwise. Queerness is a term for reimagining, resisting, and remaking the world. This is what I mean when I say Baba is queer, short for Baba is you is queer. That it reimagines, resists, and remakes the world. So saying a video game is queer doesn't necessarily mean it contains a trans character or a lesbian romance, but that it resists hegemonic logic. So how does Baba is You do this? As a puzzle game literally full of logic puzzles, how can it possibly resist hegemonic logic? First, identity is incredibly fluid in Baba is You. Because the player constructs sentences writing blank is you in order to determine which sprite on the screen they control, the definition of you is constantly changing. Compare this to the hegemonic way that heteronormativity operates. It demands that a female assigned at birth present their body in a certain way, be attracted to men, define themselves as woman. While I have argued that the goal-oriented nature of Baba is You reinforces the idea that certain things have essences, the same goal-oriented nature makes it clear that sometimes in order to reach our goals, whether that's a flag or to be ourselves, we have to change what or who we are. Similarly, the function of objects is in constant flux for the player. One moment you can push a boulder around, the next moment you can't. You can set an object to move on its own or fall down to the bottom of the screen. Any object can act as a key or as a door to be opened. Thus, the game asks the player to reimagine the purpose of objects, to see them as malleable rather than fixed. It remakes the world as one where use is not singular, but multiple. Finally, Baba is You plays with desire. Consider that heteronormative logic dictates that there is one romantic goal, a partner of the opposite gender. Yet, in Baba is You, the goalposts are constantly shifting. Flag might be win one moment, but you might switch that goal to boulder or even yourself. Thus, the object of desire is just as fluid as identity in the structure of Baba is You. It's about finding the goal that suits you, not the one predetermined for you. This idea is complicated a bit by the design of puzzles, which are often construed so that there is only one way to win. But since that way to win is rarely what it seems, any normative assumption as to how to advance forward is automatically challenged. Is flag win, or could it be something else? Regardless of the answer, the player is still put in a place of questioning what their identity and desire are and could be. This act of questioning is core to Baba is You's queerness, because it asks the player to reimagine the world, to ask, what if? What if I were Kiki? What if my desire was a skull instead of a flag? What if a door unlocked a key rather than the other way around? This questioning fundamentally resists hegemonic logic, because rather than having who you are and what you want predetermined and forced upon you, you freely explore, asking, maybe I am blank. Maybe I want blank. There is nothing intrinsically forcing you in the act of investigation to choose a side. Thus, Baba is You, despite being a Sokoban game, rejects the normativity of its progenitor and suggests a world without such strict parameters of success and failure. It is important to note that a game can both be normative and transformative at the same time. While I didn't propose such a reading here, we could try to interpret Sokoban as a queer game too. Baba is Yu's insistence on achieving goals to advance is normative in some senses, and nuances of grammar and language are lost on its simplistic portrayal of nouns that exactly relay the essence of the word they represent. 
Yet, in the act of play, there are no normative answers in Baba Is You. It is a game where perception and reality rarely line up. One which encourages an inquisitive and open mindset rather than a closed and rigid one. This resistance to normativity makes Baba Is You a queer game. So I guess it's time for the bottom line. Sokoban is a beautiful puzzle game about pushing boxes informed by a peculiar set of explicit and implicit rules that make it fun. It proposes though a normative world, one where work always yields results and solutions are always straightforward. The tendrils of this heteronormative underbelly reach far beyond itself to future sexualized box games like Catherine, Seek Girls 1 through 8, and Helltaker. Sokoban is unflinchingly honest and almost unbearably inflexible in its tedium, mimicking its designer's opinions of computers. Baba Is You expertly deconstructs Sokoban. It resists its hegemonic and normative impulses to propose a new world where identity, purpose, and desire are not fixed. In this deconstruction, it suggests the complicated nature of words while reifying the Western tradition of coalescing language and reality, but still manages to present a queer vision of the world. It fulfills the core promise of Sokoban, though a few decades late, making you think outside the box. Now that you've reached the end of the video, I just want to say thank you for watching. This is the most ambitious project I've done on YouTube, and if this goes over well, I hope to make more long-form videos like this. So please let me know in the comments below if you want to see more videos like this. Believe it or not, I actually initially brainstormed this video when I started the channel as like a five minute thing. Basically saying, I like Sokoban. If you like these insane videos, come join our Discord too, where you can have conversations with me and other like-minded people. Otherwise, go find a Sokoban game or buy Baba's You and think, move, and push away.